Alaska. The oil companies pay the government fees to drill on state land. And this is actually the primary source of money for Alaska's state budget, so much so that Alaska actually has reverse taxation, where most years its residents get money back from the government. Instead of paying state income tax to their state government, the state gives residents money back because they get more money from the petroleum company than they spend for their state budget. In other places, including uh, many countries in Africa, local residents do not receive any compensation for the drilling going on in their region. And once again, fossil fuels are limited, they're non-renewable, so continuing to rely on them will no longer be economically practical in the future. So our option is to just keep pumping until it's gone and then panic or develop alternative energy resources to dramatically switch over or try to find some middle course that we can gradually phase out petroleum and phase in some alternative source of energy. Conservation is a big role to uh, reducing our energy use. We do it to uh, not only to be less wasteful, but also to extend the life of our non-renewable energy supplies and reduce the impact on the environment. In the 1970s, there was a big drive for conservation as well as uh, research and funding into alternative energy. But this didn't last. When the price of oil declined again in the 1980s, many of the incentives to conserve as well as the funding into alternative energy resources were dropped and, and uh, reduced. And people for quite a long time got used to low gasoline taxes. Um, that means we pay very little taxes at the pump in the US, especially compared to countries in Europe where gas prices are really inflated by high taxes, usually that money going to uh, not only support the construction and maintenance of roads, but also to fund mass transit. Uh, in the U.S., gas taxes are only go sent for road maintenance, so uh, it becomes a self-perpetuating machine. The more we drive, the more money gets made available for roads, which means it encourages people to drive more and use mass transit less. And so many critics say what we should do is follow the European model and say, let's tax gasoline more. So again, the price of gas goes up and encourage people through incentives to take the bus, take other forms of mass transit instead. Uh, we in the US though have been pretty much used to the freedom of our cars, being able to get in the car and drive wherever we want, whenever we want to and not have to worry about bus schedules or train schedules or anything like that. Uh, but the price we pay is, well, the ever increasing price at the gas pump. Vehicle fuel efficiency is one way in which we can try to conserve. Fuel efficiency rose in the 1970s, but stagnated for many years afterwards. Uh, if you look at this stretch Hummer here, uh, if you were trying to sell this in the 1970s, if you were running a car dealership and GM uh, came up to you and said, we've got this idea for a stretch Hummer that gets like 10 gallon, 10 miles per gallon. Um, you would tell them they were crazy, nobody would buy it. But today, uh, even despite many of the high prices of gas, many gas guzzling vehicles remain popular among consumers. Uh, 2007, Congress passed uh, legislation to raise the fuel efficiency to 35 miles per gallon by the year 2020. This is already still lower than many other developed nations. This is called the CAFE standard, by the way. What about Anwar? Getting back to Anwar, will drilling in Anwar fill our demand? Remember, we could probably get about one year's worth but it will take us 50 years or more maybe to pump all that out. And when you stretch that out over 50 years, 
It turns out the impact Anwar has on the overall U.S. consumption of oil and the price we pay at the pump is minimal, a drop in the well. Literally, uh, pennies per gallon. It's, it's almost negligible. So other ways personal choices could be used, driving less, turning off unnecessary lights, turning down thermostats, buying more energy efficient machinery, switching to fuel efficient hybrid electric cars or all electric cars. Cogeneration is a way in which the excess heat produced during electrical generation is captured and used uh, to heat buildings and produce other types of power. Uh, improvements in home design and insulation can reduce uh, the energy required to heat and cool them using more energy efficient appliances. Uh, and this is all consumer choice. People need to vote with their wallets to increase the conservation efforts. Many estimates uh, project that if through conservation efforts, we could save 6 million barrels of oil a day. Uh, so conserving energy in many ways is better than finding new reserves. It not only can uh, stress the life of fossil fuels, but it also decreases the environmental impact. However, no matter how much we conserve, we're still going to need energy. So the question will come, where will we get it from? Uh, if not petroleum, then somewhere else. Nuclear power. The U.S. has what I would call a rather, not quite love-hate, but a rather um, <laughs> difficult relationship with nuclear power. On the one hand, it doesn't generate the air pollutants that are associated with fossil fuel, but uh, it's associated with nuclear weaponry, we have problems with waste disposal and the history of accidents, which has made many Americans leery of supporting the expansion of nuclear power. Based on current rates of consumption, about 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear power. Other nations have a much more heavily investment in nuclear power. France, for example, gets almost 80% of its electricity from nuclear power. Uh, Japan, over the past several years, has also invested heavily in, in nuclear power. However, in light of the recent Fukushima accident, uh, that country is currently in the midst of a reassessment of its commitment to nuclear power. Nuclear power generated in a commercial nuclear power plant is the result of what we call fission. Nuclear fission is the splitting of a heavy atomic nucleus into smaller nucleus, nuclei. It starts with a fissionable atom such as uranium-235. And this is a very heavy nucleus and it's quite unstable in fact, if you were to hit it with a neutron, if a free neutron were to smack into this uranium nucleus, it would cause this nucleus to split apart into two smaller nuclei, in this case krypton and barium. It will also release a tiny burst of energy, as well as some free neutrons. And these neutrons could then fly off and hit other uranium atoms, splitting those apart which in turn then would continue a chain reaction of nuclear fission. Now one of the problems with this model is, well, neutrons fly too fast. They zip around at near the speed of light. It's, and this really reduces the odds that an individual neutron will actually hit a uranium-235 atom. In order to achieve nuclear fission, the neutrons must be slowed down a little bit. Uh, they do this by putting the uranium, uranium in a substance called a moderator. In US commercial reactors, the moderator is water. Although some reactors use graphite, a form of carbon as the moderator. 
Now, of course, you want to control the reaction. You don't want it to overheat and get out of control. So there are a number of ways to control the reaction. And one is through the use of control rods. These are rods of material that absorb neutrons. And simply by raising and lowering the control rods in the reactor, you can control the reaction. So here's our schematic of a nuclear reactor. Right here is the core of the reactor. The nuclear fuel itself is put into little tiny pellets. And the pellets are stacked up in little fuel elements, little rods. Uh, and the rods are then placed inside the reactor core, which is filled with a moderator. In this case, it is water. And these are our control rods. When the control rods are completely down, they're absorbing the neutrons and preventing the reaction from occurring. Simply by raising these rods a little bit, we'll let some neutrons zip around and start interacting with the uranium atoms, splitting them off and starting a reaction going. As the reaction is going and you start getting millions and millions of uranium atoms splitting and releasing energy, the water in this loop here heats up. Now this primary loop serves two purposes. One is to absorb the heat so that it can be used as a source of energy to run a turbo generator, but also to keep the reactor itself from overheating by removing some excess heat. You need to keep pumping coolant water into the reactor to take away the heat. So this heat is taken away. Now this loop of water is kept under tremendous pressure so that it actually doesn't boil, even though it's heated up to well above the normal boiling point of water. So this highly pressurized water is continually circulating through this primary loop. The heat from this loop is transferred to the water in the secondary loop, and this water is allowed to boil. That water gets converted to steam, and the steam, as it escapes, runs our turbo generator. And then its heat is, in turn, transferred to the water in the coolant loop. And that heat then is allowed to escape up through the coolant tower in the form of steam. And this water is usually taken from a local body of water, like, for example, the Susquehanna River for nuclear power plants like Three Mile Island and Peach Bottom. And the steam, after it's been cooled, is recondensed back into liquid and pumped back through, continually moving through the secondary loop. Now, this two-loop model has one advantage. Everything in this primary loop is contaminated with radioactive material because it's in direct contact with the nuclear fuel. So this is all radioactive. But this secondary loop is prevented from becoming contaminated because it doesn't come in direct contact. The only thing that gets transferred is the heat. So the advantage here is that this steam is not laden up with radioactive contamination, and therefore all of your equipment here, including your turbo generator, is free of contamination. So when you have to do maintenance on your generator, for example, you, you, know, you don't have to have your workers suit up in those moon suits and decontaminate every component before they get to work on it. It saves a lot on maintenance costs for everything outside of our reactor building. Now, our reactor containment building here is another important part of our nuclear power plant. This is designed to contain our nuclear fuel in the event of a catastrophic accident to prevent what is known as a meltdown. A meltdown is when the metal components of our reactor core heat up to the point where they start to melt. And as it melts, it falls down. That's where the term melt down comes from. As it melts down, it may fall into water, superheating that water. If you've ever thrown a hot piece of metal into a bucket of water, you get a lot of steam really fast. And this steam, and a worst case scenario could cause a buildup of steam pressure inside the containment building. And hopefully the containment building will be able to withstand that pressure because if it doesn't, and this containment building blows apart from the steam explosion, it could spread a plume 
of radioactive contamination all over a wide area. Now, our fuel for nuclear power is an isotope of uranium called uranium-235. That is the isotope of uranium that is fissionable. It will split when you pop, hit it with neutrons. However, most of the uranium found in the world is actually uranium-238, a different isotope. You remember isotopes differ, they're the same element, but they have a different number of neutrons. So uranium-238 has three more neutrons in it than uranium-235. But U-238 is not fissionable. It will not split when bombarded with uh, neutrons. And uh, uranium, with a, that is 99% of U-238, is not of usable fuel. So the first thing that we have to do before we can use uranium as a fuel is process it. And the process is called enrichment, where they increase the amount of U-238 in a multi-stage process that involves a lot of centrifuges to increase it to 3%. That makes it a usable fuel. Now, 3% is still not enough to make a nuclear bomb. You cannot get a big explosion of a nuclear bomb. Uh, with 3%. You needed to get up in the range of 40% U-235 before you have what they call weapons-grade uranium. And uranium has a very long half-life, uh, but over time, as it, it's used up in the reactor and more and more uranium-235 gets split apart, eventually that has to be replaced. So every few years, the power plant has to pull the old fuel elements out and replace them with fresh ones. The spent fuel could be reprocessed for use or disposed of as radioactive waste. Now, under an executive order issued by President Gerald Ford, shows you how far back we're going here, reprocessing of uranium fuel is not a viable uh, use. It's illegal in this country. And this exec executive order was issued because of fears that this reprocessed uranium could be used for nuclear weapons and could fall in the hands of terrorists or whatever. Um, so in the U.S., the plan has been to find a permanent disposal site of the radioactive waste that is generated by our power plants. Now, nuclear advantage, nuclear power has a number of advantages. For one, it does generate a lot less air pollutants, and it doesn't really generate any carbon dioxide. So nuclear power is something that many proponents uh, point to as an alternative that will not contribute to climate change. And it poses few chronic health, fewer chronic health risks compared to fossil fuels. Um, they also cause less damage to the landscape, generate a uh, smaller volume of waste, and are actually safer for workers than coal-fired coal plants. However, there are a number of drawbacks to nuclear power that have really restricted its use. One being that the waste generated is radioactive. And if it's occurred, if an accident occurs, or if the plant is sabotaged, the results could be catastrophic. Today, the world has 439 operating power plants in 31 countries. Now, if you kind of picture life in the 50s and 60s when nuclear power was really being actively sold to the public, uh, one of the phrases they used then was that it would generate electricity that was too cheap to meter. In other words, you wouldn't have to have the meters that you have outside your home measuring your monthly kilowatt hour consumption of electricity and basing your bill on how much electricity you use each month. Instead, you would just pay the power plant a flat fee, much like uh, your cable bill or your internet service provider charges you just a flat fee. I mean, you pay the cable company the same amount every month, whether you watch 10 hours of television that month or 100 hours that month. 
It's the same amount. And that's the way they projected nuclear power would be. And they also predicted that by the turn of the century, by the beginning of the 21st century, we would have a thousand nuclear power plants across this country. And it would generate most of our electricity. Now, in reality, uh, the number of power plants and reactors in the U.S. peaked at 104. And we never came close to reaching that goal of being too cheap to meter. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one of the big ones being accidents. Uh, accidents have been really uh, devastating to the public image of nuclear power. And in particular, the one that really soured the American public on nuclear power was the one that occurred here in Pennsylvania at Three Mile Island. We have an aerial shot of Three Mile Island. There are two reactors on Three Mile Island. Unit one which is the one where we see steam coming out of these two coolant towers. These are associated to the reactor unit one. And then we have unit two. This is unit two right here, this reactor. And these were the coolant towers that were associated with this. Unit two is where the accident occurred. And you can see most of the piping and everything has long been dismantled here. Unit two has been mothballed ever since the accident and the cleanup while well, Unit 1 continues to operate to this day. So, Three Mile Island, this was the most serious accident in the U.S. It occurred in 1979. Uh, what happened was a stuck coolant valve triggered a loss of coolant water, which led to a partial meltdown in the reactor which resulted a buildup of a gas bubble and radioactive material trapped inside the containment building. Three Mile Island was regarded as a near miss. It could have been a lot worse. Uh, the cleanup cost uh, billions of dollars. And here's what happened. There was a stuck coolant valve that allowed the coolant water to drain out of the reactor. A technician, misread the gauge and thought the reactor was full of water when it wasn't. And the result was a partial meltdown of the reactor uh, until they could vent the radioactive gas out of the power plant and it took several years to clean up the mess. Now, if you were living in the Harrisburg area, you probably saw this on your TV in 1979. This were the evacuation zones, where they were uh, telling almost everybody in this inner circle to get out. They were telling pregnant women and small children in this next circle to get out, and pregnant women in this circle here to get out. Officially, there were no deaths attributed to nuclear power. There was only a small amount of radiation that was released. Uh, during the accident cleanup. However, several people sued Three Mile Island's owners, alleging that they or their family members contracted cancer as a result of the accident. Uh, these lawsuits did not prevail. Most of them were eventually tossed out of court uh, because basically of dueling experts. The plaintiff's attorneys, they had their experts who said this amount of radiation was emitted and it caused you know, this increase in cancer risk, while the defendant said, well, this is the official account by the EPA of how much radiation was released, and the risk of cancer to this is much lower than the plaintiffs are alleging. And the judge in the case uh, sided with the defendants and threw most of the cases out, basically agreeing with the experts uh, who were on the side of Three Mile Island's owners. A more devastating accident was the one that occurred in Chernobyl. This was the Chernobyl power plant in the former Soviet Republic of Ukraine. In 1986, there was an explosion. This was caused by human error combined with an unsafe design. Here's basically what happened. They were testing the backup diesel generators at the power plant. These are 
backup generators to keep the reactor supplied with coolant water in the event of a shutdown. And while they were testing the diesel generators, the technicians, for reasons which remain unclear to this day, disabled several of the safety features on the power plant, drained the coolant water out of the reactor, and pulled those control rods completely out of the reactor. Now, based on our understanding of what can happen to a reactor, when you do this, the inevitable result is the reactor will get really, really hot. And this is what happened. And when the reactor got really hot, the technicians tried to reinsert the control rods really rapidly. However, those control rods had a carbon tip on the end of them. And that was the first thing that re-entered the reactor as they pushed the control rods back into it. And I mentioned carbon can act as a moderator. So instead of shutting the reactor down, those tips actually accelerated the reactor. The result was a total meltdown, a steam explosion that released a plume of radioactive material that circumnavigated the globe. And uh, the first people to be aware of this outside of the Soviet Union were some nuclear scientists in Finland who started noticing that their radiation detectors were registering high levels of radioactivity. So they called their counterparts in the Soviet Union up and said, is there a problem? And in typical pre glasnost openness, the Soviets said, nope, nope, everything's under control. No problems here. Nope, nope, everything's all under control. And then the, the Finnish scientists looked at their readings again and said, no, really, guys, we know you've got something going on there. And they had to eventually admit that, yes, uh, the reactor experienced a devastating, catastrophic explosion. Uh, firefighters were marched into the reactor at gunpoint to put out the fires because many of them got lethal dosages of radiation from the, from the uh, burning core. The accident killed 31 people directly and many more developed radiation sickness or cancer as a result of exposure to the radiation in particular, thyroid cancer rates in the region uh, significantly went up in the years after the, react, the, actual, the accident. Today, uh, the reactor is encased in a giant concrete sarcophagus to contain it, but this is starting to show some cracks, so a new, bigger sarcophagus is being built over top of it to uh, further contain it. More recently, we had the nuclear re accidents in Fukushima. This was the result of a series of devastating disasters that occurred one after the other in Japan. First, there was an earthquake. The earthquake triggered a tsunami, and the tsunami then damaged three nuclear power plants in Japan. And this disabled the ability to keep the reactor supplied with coolant water. The reactors began to overheat, and they experienced some severe uh, problems, including the release of radiation. And this, in turn, released some plumes of radioactive material that spread across the Pacific Ocean. Now, in addition to the concern about accidents, we also have to contend with the problem of nuclear waste. Nuclear waste will remain radioactive for thousands of years. So if you can imagine if the Roman Empire had nuclear waste, the waste they generated would still be radioactive today. We would still be dealing with their nuclear waste. And we have power plants all over the country that contain spent fuel rods that are put in pools of cooling water to contain them. These are temporary storage methods to keep the uh, fuel rods and contain leakage until a permanent repository is built. And here is where the high-level radioactive waste is currently being stored in these temporary 
sites. And right here, that, that's Three Mile Island right there. The plan originally was to build a permanent repository in Yucca Mountain, Nevada. And as you can see, Nevada doesn't actually have any nuclear power plants in it. This is one of the many reasons why residents of Nevada didn't like this idea. But there was a nationwide survey to pick the perfect place to put it. And then senators and representatives in Congress from every other state said, yep, Nevada is a good place to put it. Uh, but the people and state government in Nevada did, still didn't like that plan for a number of reasons. One, they have no nuclear power plants, so their argument is, well, why are we taking everyone else's garbage? And then, um, guess where we tested our nuclear weapons in the deserts of Nevada? So many residents of Nevada think that we've already got enough radiation already. Thank you very much. We don't want the waste site here. But they got outvoted in Congress. Congress appropriated money to start building the waste site in Yucca Mountain, Nevada. And here it is in relation to the cities of Las Vegas and Reno. And they started digging tunnels. And the plan was to put the waste in concrete casks, bury the cask in underground tunnels, and store it there. The plan was to begin receiving waste in the year 2017. And this was actually like 20 years behind schedule, as it was, because of uh, political wrangling. And then, well, uh, we'll get to that. But why Yucca Mountain? It's in a remote and unpopulated area. Uh, it's geologically stable. There hasn't been an earthquake or any type of volcanic activity in 5,000 years there. Does that mean there won't be one in the next 5,000 years there? Who knows? Uh, but it is dry, so we, the, we have less problems of groundwater contamination. The water table is deep below ground. It's on federal land. It's actually an Indian reservation. Uh, and the, the federal government is paying that uh, tribe a lot of money for the rights to bury it there. Uh, and the waste uh, was to go there for 120 current storage areas, which includes commercial nuclear power plants and military installations. And one of the concerns raised, particularly in the post 9-11 years, was, well, we're going to have to transport the waste by train and truck um, across public highways and railroads through the states, particularly passing through many populated areas. So there was concern then, well, what happens if there's an accident or a terrorist sabotage one of these trains, so that was raised then. But then uh, in recent years, Yucca Mountain hit a roadblock. And this was just as the picking of Yo Yucca Mountain as the repository was mainly political, the killing of it was also political. And it goes back to uh, some recent elections. The current Majority leader in the U.S. Senate is a fellow by the name of Harry Reid, and Harry Reid represents Nevada in the Senate. And he was facing a pretty tough reelection campaign in 2010, and he really needed something to help shore up his popularity in Nevada. So he convinced the uh, Obama administration to cancel Yucca Mountain which, as I said, was wildly unpopular in Nevada. And this helped uh, his reelection cha uh, chances. However, it left us with no permanent repository. And we're still trying to figure out where this country is going to put the thousands of tons of nuclear waste that we have already generated. Many people have also said uh, that now's the time to start expanding nuclear power. We have smaller, more modular designs of nuclear reactors. Uh, instead of one big one, they're proposing four or five small ones, which have less chances of devastating accidents. Um, and so we're saying it's safer. Uh, to build newer power plants, and of course, many of these older ones are now reaching the end of their life cycle, and their power is going to have to be replaced. Their contribution to the electric grid 
is going to have to be replaced very soon. Uh, many of them turning out they're only living as about half as long as they're uh, initially expected. Turns out when you bombard steel pipes with neutrons for a couple of decades, they start to become brittle and it costs more to build, maintain, operate nuclear power plants than it was initially estimated. So that too, treat, too cheap to meter dream never occurred. We never got to that point. Turns out nuclear power plants are a lot more expensive to operate than previously thought. Maintenance costs are higher. Insurance costs went up tremendously after the Three Mile Island accident. And new safety standards had to be implemented after the accident, and that made them more expensive. So many of the current power plants are actually much more costly than initially estimated, and they're going to have to be shut down in the coming decades. So many people say, well, now's the time to start building new nuclear power plants to not only replace uh, the nuclear power plants that currently are being phased out, but also to reduce our dependence on other sources of energy, such as coal or oil. And that's one of the arguments in favor of nuclear power that's often advanced. It will reduce our dependence on oil imported from other countries. Now, is that true? Did that really happen? Well, yes and no. First of all, if you look at our production of electricity. The biggest single producer of electricity is coal, while oil is actually a very small percentage of our overall electricity portfolio. Oil is too valuable as a transportation fuel and for the plastics and the other commercial products that we made out of it uh, to really waste on electricity. So we use a lot of other sources of energy to generate the electricity electricity uh, rather than oil. So in terms of electricity generation, more nuclear power plants will actually have a bigger impact on our use of coal than oil. And you know, that's good, you know, if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, reducing our dependence on coal, that's a plus for nuclear power right there. What do we use oil for? Well, as I said, our biggest use of it is transportation. About two thirds of our electricity, or sorry, two thirds of our oil consumption goes to transportation. 25% uh, is industrial, 6% goes to residential commercial use, and only 2% of our electrical power, of our oil, goes to electrical power. So two out of every 100 barrels that we consume is used for electricity. So, oil is not really used widespread for electricity. So once again, the biggest competitor for nuclear power is coal. Because really nuclear power is mostly used for electricity. It's really the only thing we can use for it on a commercial level. Uh, while oil is primarily a transportation energy source. Uh, in the future, um, it may compete with oil if we switch to more uh, electric cars or hybrid electric cars, to so the Chevy Volt. Um, the Chevy Volt is a new hybrid electric car designed to cover the average American's commute without using any electricity. And after a number of uh, delays brought on by many of the financial difficulties that General Motors experienced in recent years, the Chevy Volt reached market last year in 2010. Um, so if we switch to more electric and hybrid electric cars, that will reduce our use of petroleum as a transportation source. And therefore nuclear power, which again is primarily used to generate electricity, will become a more significant player in the transportation sphere. Right now, the only areas where we use nuclear power in terms of transportation are for things like subways, which are powered by electricity, or in a naval vessels, such as submarines, which are powered by nuclear power plants. Um, those are the only type of transportation that really 
uh, get any use from nuclear power. So if we switch more and more transportation to electricity-based, then nuclear power will become a significant player in the transportation market, and we will shift away from petroleum to nuclear power. That would be one incentive to increase the amount of nuclear power. But of course, uh, to meet that, uh, we'd also have to address the waste problem and allay consumers' fears about the safety of it. And with the recent Fukushima accidents, even countries like Japan that were very committed to expanding nuclear power are starting to take a second look at it and saying, maybe we shouldn't be building so many of them. And of course, um, we need electricity as our transportation source rather than nuclear powered cars because well, they're unlikely in the foreseeable future. We're not going to have nuclear powered DeLoreans anytime soon. And that's it for non-renewable energy.